my job is up for grabs. My marriage is up for grabs. I mean, if I told my mom and my dad where I was, the phone would simply go dead. This is Death, Sex, and Money. The show from WNYC about the things we think about a lot and need to talk about more. I'm Anna Sale. In our longest relationships, there are ebbs and flows of closeness. Sometimes intentional, sometimes not, depending on what's going on in your life or whether it's easy to be together. And then sometimes, no matter how entangled you are, there's a rupture, a break. You become estranged from the people you come from or from the communities that once felt like home. I have been estranged from my family since I was 16. I I moved out and I just never saw them again. I'm in a uh... A 13-year journey of trying to estrange myself and my sister from our mom. And I haven't spoken to them for the last 129 days. I don't even know that I'd recognize him on the street if I saw him or recognize his voice. When we asked you, our listeners, earlier this year about your experiences with estrangement, hundreds of you shared stories. You told us about the moment you knew you were done. He told me he would not come to my wedding. She reminded me often that I wasn't wanted. She wanted to have an abortion. He will just message you out of nowhere, tearing you down, letting you know what a loser he thinks you are. I was diagnosed with cancer. I just remember, like, I called him and I said, you know, I have something I really need to talk to you about. It's really important. And he said, well, can it wait? I'm just not in a really good place right now. And that's when I decided to draw a line in the sand. I was left with this turning point in our relationship. And I never saw them again. You described what estrangement feels like in your body. Estrangement feels like I've lost a limb and I'm learning how to live without it. The pain is physical. I wake up with lots of tension in my shoulders. I feel like I sit and sink in that gray area every single day. But your estrangement stories were also about finding your strength. I did what I had to do in order to be able to live with myself. I'm so proud of myself. And I just mourn for the family that I think I should have had, and I didn't. It's difficult to find reliable data on how common estrangement is. One national survey published in 2020 found that more than a quarter of American adults had cut off contact with a family member. And that's just one kind of estrangement. Others of you have lost communities, your sense of national identity, or entire belief systems. I think I was 14 when they officially excommunicated us. Um, my, my uncle wrote the letter, and everyone signed it. We are bringing you three episodes in this series about different stages of estrangement and varied vantage points. Some of you are years out, decades into making that hard boundary. Others have had estrangement happen to you for reasons you haven't always understood and couldn't control. He just told me he couldn't come anymore, and he wasn't able to share why. We heard about the families and communities you've rebuilt after estrangement. And we heard from those of you just newly contemplating the idea. Not quite there yet. How do I do it? Do I let him know? Or do I just block him? Or do I leave him unblocked and just ignore his messages? I'm sort of mourning this relationship slowly, and I'm just not ready to fully kill it. That's where Brian was when he reached out to us in early June. He said he felt caught between two worlds. On the one hand, his growing disillusionment with the religion he grew up in, and on the other, his wife and parents who are still embedded in that religion. Losing one would mean losing the other. I'm stuck in a way because my wife is still, for lack of a better word, a true believer. And that connects me to it in a way that um, 
I'm just fear riddled that uh, I'll lose her if I lose, if I leave completely. Because I know I'll lose my parents completely if I leave. Um, They'll cut me off, 100% cut me off. Brian asked us not to use his real name or to identify his particular religious community. It's Christian, with meetings and services multiple times a week. He describes the community as high control. There is real clear guidance on, gosh, everything, like what you should or shouldn't watch on TV, what you should or shouldn't do, um, and what you read, uh, what, what movies you see, um, you know, even rules on what you do and don't do in the bedroom. Brian said he started to feel doubts in his mid-20s. He's in his mid-40s now. I think as an adult, you, um, you look at your behaviors and you decide which ones are worth maintaining and which ones are not. <laughs> and the, the constant pressure to do more, more, more for the faith, it left me with this uh, incredible feeling of um, inadequacy. I could never do enough. And every time you would reach for um, the goal line or the finish line of whatever it was you were trying to do, it felt like it moved. Like an exhaustion with trying to please. Exactly. And you reached out to us when we asked our listeners about experiences of estrangement. Um, When I asked that, with that word estrangement, what connected for you? about that? You know, uh, when you're raised um, from the beginning of your uh, formative thought process in, in, a, in, a, in a group like I was or, or am, uh, your entire life perspective is really kind of built on that as, a, as, its, as its basis, right? Um, and not just morality, it's what you do with your time, how you plan for your future, Um, Even the definition of the word future is different, right? When you're a a devout believer, you believe at any time the end could come, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a separation. The estrangement is a separation, not just from my community, but from an an entire belief system. You said, um, I was, and then you corrected yourself and said, I am. Um, what is your current relationship to the church community? I stay in it as much as I have to. And I have to, and that's that the have to is, is based upon, is predicated on, um, how much turmoil I want to take on at any given time. (laughs) I don't want to cause my wife any more stress because of what it would mean for her. And not to mention the fact that the job that I have puts me in touch with or in constant contact with people who are uh, 100% um, still in that world. And it would, uh, my separation from it would um, abbreviate or, or uh, truncate all those relationships. What does your wife know? Mm, she knows how I feel about the organization. She knows how I feel about um, the different beliefs that we've had over the years that I no longer hold on to. Um, I don't, I I think maybe, maybe if if the one thing I wish I were a little more transparent with her about is just how kind of done with the day-to-day stuff I want to (laughs) be. Does she know we're speaking? (sighs) Does it make me a bad husband if I say no? Does it change the answer? (laughs) I don't know. I, I don't think it makes you a bad husband either way. Um, just speaks to where you are in the process, I feel like. So no, she doesn't. No. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. Um, because of the way the organization handles marriages, it's, it's, it's to, the, to, the, to her, my separation from the religion would feel like I was generally calling into question morality and that it might also include my, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the word for it. Um, trying to, it would, that, that would include my dedication to her, my promises to her. 
I see. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a 100% one woman man. And it's always been her since we were, since we were kids. It's, it was her. Um, and so I, I'm just not, I'm not a, I'm not the kind of guy that looks around. I'm not the kind of guy that it's going to show too much attention in the wrong direction, but to have to, to, to reaffirm my fidelity as a husband, that's, I don't know. It's irritating. <laughs> it's, it makes me more mad at the organization that they taught us to believe that way. Yeah. I, I hate it. I hate it from, for my wife because I just can't blind her with the honesty of it I have to slow roll it because if I just unload she won't be able to hear it and it will terrify her so you are trying to figure out how to live honestly while knowing that this is a bomb in your marriage. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, you're the bomb is a is a it's this it's a super destructive thing, right? Just tears everything apart all at once. And that's not how this would go. That's not how this would go. If it if it did cause the failure of my marriage, which I have to say out loud, I'm generally unwilling to accept. Mm -hmm. I'm not even generally, I'm absolutely unwilling to accept. Mm -hmm. um, it would be in, it would be in really small steps. It would be the absence of family invitations, the reduction in family phone calls, the um, seeing the posts on social media from family members doing things together that we weren't invited to that would lead to her seeing me as less of an asset to her life and more of a, uh, a weight. Mm. Like estrangement by a thousand cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Are you and your, are you and your wife raising kids? No. Isn't it awful to think that that's a mercy? I don't know. I, I couldn't teach a kid to believe this way. I couldn't, I couldn't allow it to go by. Was it intentional not to become parents? No. No, we tried. It wasn't, uh, wasn't biologically possible for us. I imagine that was years ago, but now you see that as a grace, as a blessing. Yeah, not that awful? <laughs> no, it, it's a sm it's a it's it's a major crime because um, my wife's um, ma maternal instinct is so strong. She would have been the world's greatest mom. Coming up. Brian talks about why he first started feeling alienated from church. I watched my brother struggle with the knowledge that his family felt that he was damned. And I've watched my sister deal with the same. And how that they have broken themselves trying to regain the approval of their families. It broke my brother till he died. And it almost did that to my sister. This is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. I'm Anna Sale. Brian told us he wasn't the first person in his family to consider life outside their religious community. Both his siblings, his older brother and younger sister, became estranged from the church and thus their parents. First, it was his brother who began distancing himself when he was in his early 20s. At the time, Brian was a teenager, still devout, and very disapproving of his brother. I was always the good kid, and he had all of the the pinnings of the rebellious child. And so I um, yeah, just continued to make decisions that I thought mom and dad would be proud of, which put me in the position where our my relationship with him was, there was a lot less communication. 
there was always this fine point. I remember telling him one time that, um, you know, I, I was okay to, to hang out with him and, and, and talk and do whatever. But if he ever mentioned anything that was contrary to our religious upbringing, that that was just the end of it. That you couldn't sustain a relationship if he was going to talk to you about that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I just, I wouldn't, I couldn't hear it or wouldn't hear it. There's, um, I guess for lack of a better word, there's a thought blocking that, that comes into the the way that we're taught that you can't, yeah, it, there's, I've, I've seen it on my wife's face and I'm sure it was on mine when I talked to my brother, like you, you, when you get to the point where the discussion goes towards something that isn't in line with, with teaching, with the teachings, you, you, your face changes and you can tell the person stop listening or they, because they simply cannot hear it. Mm-hmm. And as he, as he grew away from the faith, his lifestyle grew increasingly uh, less like mine um, and more like, you know, who he wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And his sexuality was in question to him. And because of my fundamentalist upbringing, I was really cold about that. Mm-hmm. How long ago did you lose him? Did he die? Uh, it's been about six years. Six years. Are you comfortable sharing how he died? I am. He, um, he, he drank himself to death. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. I, um, he went into the hospital on a Thursday. Um, and I went in to talk to him one night and I leaned in and I said, um, I love you. And he said, I love you back. And I think I was the last person he spoke to. A couple of days later, his body just gave out. I think the official cause of death was multi-system failure. So, yeah, by, by Sunday, he was gone. It's nice that you got to visit him. Yeah. Yeah, he knew it. <clears throat> he knew how I felt. So. Did your brother know that, that how you were thinking about your faith? Your individual faith was shifting? No. No, I think he and I would have been uh, really close right now um, because of it. I think he would have enjoyed the person I think I'm becoming. Oh, that's beautiful, and there's such a sadness to that. I know. When Brian's younger sister left the faith community at 18, their relationship ended more abruptly. Brian and everyone else in her family cut her off. She left in a very different way. Um, My brother faded away, which um, was easier for me to maintain a relationship with him. Um, My sister was pulled away um, because the congregation decided her behaviors was were not ones they could tolerate so they excommunicated she was cast out yes and when the yeah. church cast her out you cast her out as well i did i did i didn't speak to her for almost 20 years And she lost her whole community? She did. Her, all of her friends. Um, all, all of her friends, her lifelong friends. There's probably there's even several she probably has yet to be able to communicate with because she still carries the, the label that the organization put on her. A scarlet letter, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, that's what I'm... It Was it... Uh, this might... I'm just curious. I just make, want to make sure I'm understanding. Was it some violation of something about sexual morality? It, it, it's even more trite than that. It was cigarettes. She smoked a cigarette. Other people saw her do it. It was found out. It was reported to the people in charge of, of that particular congregation. She told her story and they didn't believe she wasn't lying. And it's, it's sick, isn't it? It's sick how small that is. Kid trying cigarettes. 
After she was excommunicated, Brian says his sister struggled with drug addiction and got in trouble with the law. They were estranged for 20 years. But when their older brother died, Brian picked up the phone and called his sister. She was far more forgiving than uh, I deserved, for sure. Um, yeah, just how you can't just apologize for 20 years of silence and all the times you should have said something. It's just, it's just not, I mean, I did, I did apologize. But it's, uh, you are what you do and not what you say. So I, I've got some time left to prove that I meant it. And I intend to and have been. But uh, I, I was just doing what I was supposed to. I was doing what was, it was, it was considered to be right. When you're brought up that way, you have to stop believing in what is right or what you thought was right. You have to acknowledge that it just, it, just, it wasn't. It just wasn't. It was wrong. Does your sister hold on to any faith? Uh, is she still a believer in some ways in the teachings of the religion you grew up in? No. Is she... Um, is she helping you have language to critique the religion you grew up in? Uh, in I, I think it just in trying to be available to her, yeah, I think she's it's she's helped me to kind of work around some of the same thought blocks that I had in place. There's a really good friend of mine who um, was even more. Uh, involved in in the group that I was who pulled himself out of it in his family. And he and I have kept in really close communication. And that's helped a lot too, mm. is to have someone to talk that out with. Uh, um, yeah, I'm not the most emotionally uh, mature or uh, conscious person. A lot of times I'm like a little kid who cries because he's both hungry and tired. And I don't know. So I'll cry and not know why. <laughs> and I think he's helped me out a lot with that, knowing knowing why instead of uh, just being a, a general wad of anxiety and anger. Hmm. Is your relationship with this friend secret? No. No, that's... I am... Um, because his his family is still nearby, and, and I'll still bump into them occasionally. Um, but it is known, it is known that he's left. Mm-hmm. And because he left and I maintain communication, it puts me on the watch list. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I won't hide that from the religious community, that I am both communicating with my sister and that I am communicating with my friend. I won't hide that. I, I, it, because to me, that would feel like I was doing the same thing. I owe it to I owe it to my sister, who I can still prove it to, and I owe it to my brother's memory to not be ashamed of them. That's a listener we're calling Brian. Since we talked a few months ago, Brian emailed us an update. I had an open conversation with my parents about where I'm at. The result has been what I thought a dismissive withdrawal of most normal communication, he wrote. But he said he felt better having been honest with them. My wife has come to a better understanding of where I am, Brian continued. She's been very forgiving, but still doesn't want to talk about it. And he said, she still doesn't know about the podcast. On next week's episode, stories from listeners about choosing estrangement and how they did it. Once they landed in Poland and they send me the text like we landed, that's when I, I block their phone numbers and their email addresses. And we hear from listeners who had estrangement done to them. Went out to the porch. It was January and it was cold. And I remember picking up the note and being so excited by having a note from my daughter. What was your daughter writing to tell you? Uh, that she no longer wanted to hear from me. Dad. 
Death, Sex, and Money is a listener-supported production of WNYC Studios in New York. This episode was produced by Zoe Azule. The rest of our team is Liliana Maria Percy Ruiz, Afi Yellow Duke, Tracy Hunt, Lindsay Foster Thomas, and Andrew Dunn, who composed original music for this series. Julia Furlan and Lily Clark also worked on this series with us, and it started with a pitch from our former intern, Gabriella Santana. The Reverend John Delore and Steve Lewis wrote our theme music. Thank you to Molly Ryan from Dorchester, Massachusetts, for being a member of Death, Sex, and Money and supporting us with a monthly donation. Join Molly and support what we do here by going to deathsexmoney.org slash donate. I'm on Instagram at Anna Sale Picks. That's P I C S. And the show is at Death Sex Money on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Brian says he sometimes goes to online chat rooms where they use different lingo to describe the various states of leaving religion. Like this acronym for being physically part of a community, but mentally outside of it. Have you heard the term PIMO? Physically in, mentally out. Yeah. Did you just get on Reddit? (laughs) (laughs) Is that where you are? With 100% certainty. Yeah. That's the only thing that's certain right now in your life. (laughs) I know. I'm Anna Sale, and this is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. (laughs) 